So today we are going to look at Greek architecture. Um, <clears throat> and um, we will focus on mythology, philosophy, and the democracy. Professor, your mic keeps cutting out. Like, oh, we, can, we can hear you, and then like it just fades away. Oh, okay. Let me um. Yeah, let me. Y'all, now we can hear you clearly, but like before, okay. like it just went silent. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you again if it happens. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, please do not hesitate to draw my, my attention if there is any connection problem. And um, so if I don't hear anything from you, if I don't see um, a chat note, um, then you know, I will just continue. OK, thank you. So Greek architecture um, is the the origin that defined what we call classical. You know, today we hear classical architecture, classical painting, classical music, and uh, the word classical came from the Greek culture and especially Greek architecture. So, um, <clears throat> and it, it has influenced the development of Western architecture all the way to the early 20th century and uh, classical building or classical style building, buildings are surrounding us everywhere, uh, all over the world. So it's a very influential system. So now we are going to look at, uh, look into its origin. And first, you know, the word classical, um, where does it come from? Classic, it is a Latin word. It means that which belong to the classici. Classici is the highest social rank of the Roman society. So during the Roman time, the Romans that conquered Greece, conquered much of the uh, Western world in the first century BCE, admire Greek culture and they took the Greek style, architecture, um, theater, painting, sculpture, um, as a model and uh, as a representation of the high taste for the aristoc aristocracy. So the antonym for classic during the Roman time, 2000 years ago, is the vulgar that uh, the vulgar, which vulgar at that time didn't have the, um, the you know, the uh, negative meaning associated with it. It's, um, it's, it simply means that belong to the proletary, um, that is those poor people, those people who didn't have property. So we have the classic, classic versus vulgar, during the Roman time. Um, but the word classical also um, suggests something of eternal value, art of eternal value and universal significance. Um, it, it implied that whatever is classical, the beauty is, is goes is forever and it was also meant to be universal that means no matter what ethnic background you come from and uh, what was your original culture you should be able to ap appreciate whatever is called classical so it uh, suggests something of eternal eternal value eternity so in that sense its opposite is the fashion and the vernacular fashion something that only popular during a short period of, of time that comes and goes that would soon pass is temporary. 
something that is vernacular, which means it is local, it is not universal. Maybe only the um, Aboriginal people appreciate it, but not meant to be appreciated by the entire humanity. That is the vernacular. But whatever is classical is the opposite to that. It, it means eternal. This meaning didn't exist during the Roman time. Um, it was such an as association with classical came from the 18th century, pretty much um, the, uh, from the, uh, I'm sorry, from the, you know, Renaissance period after the uh, 15th, you know, 15th, um, after the 15th century. So um, when a universal humanity was claimed um, after the long middle age uh, in the early, in the 15th century. And there is a third layer of meaning associated with classical. That is art follows a system of rules and measures to produce qualities of restraint, balance and order. Uh, whatever is classical is kind of rational, right? It has a system, it has a rule. It is not necessarily a product of genius, but a product of rational thinking, of reason, and it is predictable. That is, you know, there is some kind of mathematical order in it. And um, so whoever learned these rules uh, and the principles would be able to create something that is beautiful. Um, it is not meant to be avant-garde, not meant to be something that is, you know, very pioneering. This meaning um, came from the 18th century um, during the neoclassical period when archaeologists start to um, come up with a mathematical, rational understanding of beauty. And it is also the time when all those racial principles, um, all those kind of proportional, um, f you know, fundamental proportional principles that were calculated and measured and um, applied to whatever is called classical. So in that sense, you know, the rational, you know, classical um, is something that is kind of predictable. Um, that meaning came uh, further later. And then finally, there is a final layer of meaning applied to the word classical or classic. That is, you know, it is kind of ideal. It also uh, conjures a certain degree of aloofness without violent, excessive emotional involvement. That is something that is called classical shouldn't be too much, shouldn't be too extreme, shouldn't be um, showing excessive um, emotional expression. And this main meaning um, came the last. Um, it was pretty much a 19th century product. And in that sense, classical, its opposite is kind of romantic. And 19th century, we know there were, um, for example, in music, there is a classical, um, you know, in the late 18th century, referring to the 18th century music as classical uh, versus the 19th century romantic, um, you know, like Mozart um, versus Schumann. Um, so so we, we can see classical is significant and it is enriched by history. There were layers after layers of meanings being applied on top of the word classical, but it all originate from the Greek culture and, um, and the referring to the Greek culture as classic by the Romans. So, um, the classical kind of Greek architecture also had a um, precedence. Um, there was something before that, you know, Greece located in the um, central eastern Mediterranean, 
a, a lot of islands, a lot of mountains, a peninsula, numerous islands. Um, it, the Greek world also include Asia Minor, which is today's um, western coast of, of Turkey. So this sea called the Aegean Sea um, had cradled civilizations before the Greek speaking people came here. And Greek culture was influenced by those pre-Greek cultures tremendously. So we will take a look at, at the, uh, what, what happened before the Greeks come. So um, one example of the influence is, for example, the classical Acropolis, um, the construction Acropolis. Acropolis, Acropolis occupied the previ a previous Mycenaean cultural site. Um, before the Greeks came, turn it into the temple for Athena, it was a castle. There was a castle, and it, that was from the Mycenaean period, uh, which is, you know, around 1500 BCE. And um, so in other um, places, some of the Mycenaean castles still exist. For example, here at Mycenae, there was also a Acropolis, but that one was not dedicated for uh, Greek god, it was rather a castle for the king. Um, so Greek culture inherited that, but turned it into, uh, turned them to serve their own spiritual need and uh, uh, religious uh, rituals. Um, <clears throat> one of the significant pre-Greek culture was the um, Minoan culture. Uh, the Minoan culture is, um, you know, concentrate on the um, island of Crete. So here we have the island of, of Crete. Um, in Homer's Iliad, um, it, it says, quote, there is an, a land in the midst of a, wine, of a wine dark sea, a fair and a rich land called Crete, washed by waves on every side, densely peopled and boasting 90 cities. So on the um, island of Crete alone, there were many, many cities uh, established before the, uh, the Greek time. And some of them became oral history and recorded in the Homer's, um, Homer's Iliad, which kind of referred to a earlier age. Um, <clears throat> So that had long been considered just legend, um, but in the 19th century archeologists, some archeologists believe that um, the detailed the depiction of wonderful architectures in Homer's epics were real and they tried to um, excavate them, tried to discover them. One of them was the British Arthur Evans, um, Arthur Evans guided by Homer's epics and, and other classical mythology um, and made excavation in Greece and, and the Crete, Crete Island. He believed he dis discovered the Knossos Palace and this is the archeological site on um, the northern side of the um, Crete Island. Uh, we, it was, um, it was named by archaeologists as the the Knossos Palace. Um, of course, you know we 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 don't really know whether it is, um, but Arthur Evans certainly believed that is um, the Knossos Palace. So this Knossos Palace was associated with the um, uh, classical mythology. It was meant to um, to be a libereth uh, to imprison the Minotaur. Right. So this is the, you know, you can, um, for those of you who are not familiar with Greek mythology, you can, you know, search it and find those book to read. So there were, um, it was, it was a myth, right? The Minotaur, the bow-headed human, um, was imprisoned in the Knossos palace, which belonged to King Minos. Um, and later, um, you know, the, uh, the beast was, was killed because um, the beast eat human beings. 
Um, so it has long been considered just a mythology, um, but when when Arthur Evans discovered the site, um, he made a quite you know uh, uh, convincing case. This is the mythological Knossos Palace. One of the reason is that it does look like a labyrinth, look like a, a maze. Um, this is a huge contrast contrast to the Egyptian geometry and Egyptian order. So when now you imagine um, the uh, e uh, Egyptian complex, they all have um, symmetry, right? They all have very uh, monumental, pretentious gate. So there is never a problem finding the entrance to an Egyptian complex. The entrance was very um, obviously presented um, with huge pylons. Same is true for Mesopotamian architecture. You know, symmetry, gigantic gate, um, and, and axiality. But here you don't find that. You don't find that order. Um, it is very hard to find, the in, find an entrance, actually. The entrance is hidden. The major entrance is on the um, on the west side, and it is at the corner, and it does not link to a spacious courtyard, and it certainly does not have have symmetry. All right, it's um, shrouded within an air shaped kind of space. So this is the entrance, and that entrance um, nearby uh, there is a, a some steps, um, which is which is basically here, uh, some some steps. And um, that um, formed a forecourt, some kind of a forecourt. And after entering it, you do not um, directly enter a symmetrical space that present the, um, the buildings clearly to the visitor. Rather, you follow a very dark corridor and make many turns and until you appear in the central courtyard, right? So that's very indirect. Um, <clears throat> so that entrance was, a, um, was for a different type of ritual um, service, ritual performance on the wall. There are paintings showing people brought sacrificial objects and animals. So presumably people coming here would, um, that, would that was depicting whatever happening within this passageway, right? So, um, so one go through this kind of dark space and appear in a spacious uh, bright courtyard. The complex was also oriented toward a natural, um, not a natural landmark. Uh, Mount Joktas, uh, in the distance, was lined up with the central courtyard. Uh, but from outside, you don't notice that. Only when you are standing in the courtyard, you would notice that the the, the mountain peak looming in the distance. So Arthur Evans did a lot of um, reconstruction and um, the, when he came here, basically everything collapsed. Um, so he restored and with restoration, uh, modern archeologists also believe he destroyed um, many kind of authentic uh, historical information. For example, he restored all the columns. He believed you know, the original columns was wooden column. Um, and uh, those columns had a um, narrower base and widening kind of upward, uh, wider top. And he restored it, re restored those columns in, um, in concrete. So now these are all kind of concrete. And um, based on visual information from carving of the uh, nearby civilizations, he also restored the um, 
kind of abacus and the capital. And this abacus and capital bear similarity to future uh, classical order, uh, Greek order. But this kind of tapering up proportion is, is quite unusual. And the idea came from visual um, carvings uh, from the um, you know, stone carvings. Um, <clears throat> so many, many smaller rooms kind of come together and um, without obvious connection with one another. The connection among them needs to go through um, zigzagging corridors. Um, so very indirect connection. You know, unlike the Egyptian that you have a central space and then, you know, uh, um, peristyle halls on either side and you have that kind of order and the space was, you know, you can anticipate what you are entering, but here it is, it is quite the opposite. So one of the reason uh, Arthur Evans believe here is the location of the Knossos Palace. Um, on the west side of the courtyard, um, there is the so-called throne room, this one. The throne room is characterized by a, four, a combination of a four chamber and a main hall. So in the four chamber, there is a um, porch and that porch features a, um, a, you know, a colonnade um, with two two columns. Um, so that, uh, that spatial combination is one of the most stable architectural motif in the all um, IGNC um, architecture, including the, uh, the Minoan culture in Crete, including also the pre-Greek uh, Mycenaean culture and the heart of the um, Greek temple is pretty much developed from this idea as well. So, um, and uh, there's also a, it's called a throne room because there's a seat, um, elevated seat uh, in the middle um, of the side wall. And then there's a fire pit, um, fire, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a um, fire pit in the, in the middle of the room. And uh, there are uh, lower seating surrounding, seemingly that this is, would be the place for the ruler to meet um, meet his his inner circle of advisors. That's a, a seeming function of this room, and it is also highly kind of decorated, painted with with murals. It is also um, a, a relatively la large room uh, in the complex. So none of the rooms are super large; they are pretty small. Um, but this one is relatively bigger than the others, and it has its own axiality and. Uh, um, that core is going to develop um, future, in the future um, Greek uh, classical architecture. The Western side, um, there are also um, kind of a familiar narrow, long tunnel-like rooms, and those are storage. Um, jars of, you know, uh, wine, uh, wine jar were discovered there, um, so it's a storage. Um, and storage is usually associated with sacrificial function. And um, so that probably store those, uh, those sacrificial um, goods. And um, it might also be a redistribution center, not only for um, sacrifice, but also um, used as storage for the redistribution of uh, food supply. Um, and um, yeah, that's the, the step I mentioned that is, you know, around the square um, for the entrance area. So all the, win you know, the, the rooms are, most of them do not have window. Um, the way the rooms were lit and um, uh, ventilated was through the kind of porch. So there were courtyards and there were porch. So the four chamber provided a transition into an interior space and that four chamber um, also provide um, a source of light. 
um, and the exterior walls are totally windowless. Uh, so it's all just big, thick walls. Um, and the outline was very irregular. Uh, the so-called Knossos Palace was not the only um, pre-Greek archeological ruin discovered on the island. So there are others as well. They bear very similar um, characteristics, um, you know, physical features as the so-called Knossos Palace. So that was on Crete Island. On Greek mainland, um, for example, the um, Peloponnesus um, uh, Peninsula, Mycenaean culture uh, was discovered um, and named by uh, Heinrich uh, Schliemann. So Schliemann were like Arthur Evans, also believed in Homeric uh, epics. He also believed that he recorded in the was true. And but he concentrated on the um, you know the Asia in, uh, the area of the Greek mainland and uh, Asia Minor. So he dis he discovered discovered the famous Troy, um, the city of Troy, uh, which is the main kind of topic in in, in Iliad. Um, so, from what discovered in the so-called Mycenaean sites, it seems that Mycenaean society was semi-feudal, ruled by warrior caste. There was a lack of religious architecture, but rather from the burial objects, from their visual culture, it seems the rulers were some kind of warrior. And uh, the man architectural manifestation of the societal, uh, the society was the citadel, uh, the palace and the tomb. So citadel, basically Acropolis, a city elevated on a hillside um, and it's a castle. Uh, basically. And within it, there were palace and tombs were also incorporated into the citadel. The archetypal um, Mycenaean architectural remain was the, the castle of Mycenae. And there, um, from a tomb, Schliemann discovered a face mask. So this is probably a face, a, a death mask, you know, after one die. The um, a mold was made from the face and it was cast into gold to be covered on the face of the dead to bury. Um, Schliemann believed this is um, Agamemnon, you know, the great leader uh, who uh, invaded uh, Troy. So it was said that upon discovering the golden mask, Schliemann tele telegraphed the king of Greece I have gazed upon the face of Agamemnon. So he was also guided by um, gr Greek mythology, but he believed that was true and he tried to discover. Um, you know, he discovered much more than what it, whatever is recorded in, um, in, 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 in those uh, epics. Um, for example, at Troy, he discovered uh, many layers and some of the, those layers uh, were of the Trojan War time. Some of those, some of those layers were, you know, a thousand years older, and some of those layers were uh, more recent. So obviously, these famous sites had been continuously occupied um, all the way to the um, the Greek time. Um, so, but before the Greeks arrived here the area was already um, pretty much settled uh, and developed for thousands of years. So um, Mycenae city, it was um, enclosed by a massive wall in the irregular shape following the topography of the hillside. And then the side without a, the heavy wall was a precipitate and so there was a direct drop uh, of, a, of a cliff. So no one could, um, could invade the interior from that side. So it's a kind of very military um, architecture. 
And like all castle architecture, um, there is an entrance and that entrance is not hidden. It's not as um, mysterious as the, the Minoan um, city. It is monumental, it is obvious, but there's only one um, kind of public interest that is a public interest. There were a few secret exit, uh, for example, here, but it's hidden there and hidden, hidden within a, a kind of tunnel-like uh, vault. And there were also hidden access to groundwater, to um, springs, to cisterns, and those were kind of not meant to be discovered. Some of them were kind of deliberately um, hidden from the public notice. So there is a, a public entrance, and that is a famous um, lion gate, lion's gate of, for um, the city of Mycenae. Um, it is constructed in a way um, that is easy to defend and very hard to take. For example, um, there are protruding walls extending from the entrance and the defend, defending force could mount on, on top of those wall and um, you know shooting and um, uh, from from above uh, to those whoever try to break into the gate so there is a u-shaped space with solid vertical massive walls um, and so that the invading soldiers would be surrounded from from above. Uh, and that is the common character for all castle architecture. And this is also the case here. Um, the decorative, the sculptural images above the, um, my, the, the lion's gate um, also had that kind of military uh, character. Um, it is called lion gate because there were a pair of lions framing a column and the column was interpreted as a symbol of God, um, very abstract. But, you know, um, Arthur Evans' idea came from images like this. If you look at the, this column, it looks very similar to what Arthur Evans had done for the Knossos Palace uh, with that disc-like abacus, you know, supporting, um, uh, supporting uh, a beam and then the shaft of the column is tapering um, tapering down so the lower part is is narrower the upper part is is wider which is opposite to the normal way of shaping a column right and um, <clears throat> um, the sculpture was within a corbelled arch, all right? So this kind of arch, not a true arch, is formed by the cantilevered um, stone blocks, uh, one on top of the other, and eventually they meet in the middle. But here, that space was filled by a triangular um, stone and on which the lines and the columns was carved. Under it, we have a post and lintel structure, all right? So here it's basically um, a trilithon, right? Like the uh, Stonehenge, two huge monolithic stone uh, supporting one piece of stone lintel. And um, it indicates that most, the majority of Mycenaean architecture was constructed in wood using post and lintel system, except for the castle and for the uh, palace for the, for the kings. Uh, this is also um, strengthened by the image on top of that column. If you look at the top of this column, uh, you notice there's the column is supporting a, a beam. And on top of beam, we have those circular motif and those circles should be the end of the rafters. So it's clearly a detail of wooden architecture um, and it is carved in stone. Um, and here, this is the whole column. It's like a small section 
of a wooden wooden building. Um, the secret um, access to um, water and also the, um, the exit and do work. Surrounding walls and these exits were uh, made of um, cyclopean wall. The, we call it the cyclopean wall. Um, huge boulders that were piled up um, and they were irregularly shaped. Um, some of the, them were more regular, kind of polygonal stone, more polished, but many of them are just like that. Um, so these are referred to as cyclopean wall. And um, a corbelled underground cistern fed by a spring was outside the wall with a underground um, aqueduct. Uh, so, and, and that is located here. Um, and this exit is, is there. Um, it is small, it's, it's, it's uh, hidden behind the trees and other um, natural element. Um, so I like the public entrance in of the line um, gate. Um, it is not decorated. Um, it was meant to be uh, something that is that is uh, secret. So um, also like the case of the Minoan culture on the Crete island, Mycenaean culture also um, left many um, castles in very similar style, similar layout, which allow archaeologists to um, to create as you know a category called culture, all right? Because there are many similar sites like that, um, so it is it is it was a culture. So these these were before, um, to some extent, these were prehistoric, because not many written record from the contemporary of the construction sub uh, survived. There were no written record. Um, the earliest were the Homeric um, epics, but that was, you know, composed much, much later. Uh, Homeric uh, epics, um, you know, came from, from the, uh, uh, the classical period. Um, and uh, it was not contemporary to the culture being depicted. So, but they all, they share a lot of similarity. Um, for example, um, <clears throat> They all have a central group of buildings which were larger in scale and which also um, had some kind of a um, throne room. And this is the, um, the castle of Mycenae and uh, a central throne room features a porch um, like the throne room at the Knossos Palace, but there is another uh, four chamber before the throne room. So there's a three layers of space. Um, but again, the porch was the only source for light. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, around the wall, and then there is another source for, for light um, in the ceiling. So that back chamber, larger in size, there was a, um, there should be a opening in the roof because there are um, there is a fire pit in the middle, and there are also four columns which indicate some kind of structure was support supported above to create an opening in the ceiling. So this room, um, this kind of a complex or a, we can call it an architectural uh, unit, is um, <clears throat> quite standardized um, in Mycenaean culture. This is a castle of Tyrants. It has a similar room, also centrally located. The orientation is different, but the layout is the same, right? It's a porch, a four chamber, the throne hall with a fireplace in the middle and four columns supporting a skylight and a kind of a rectangular, um, rectangular unit. And this is pillows. So they are pretty much the same. This unit, known as Megaron, right? this is a term you should remember, <clears throat> the, the Megaron, 
This is called the Megaron. And uh, this is the reconstruction of um, the Megaron at um, Mycenae. So it's uh, quite spacious. So the light from the four chamber and the porch was not enough. And in the center, we have this ceiling and a kind of a fireplace. So that ceiling opening also um, also functioned as the uh, smoke stack so that smoke can come out from, from that location. So this is the, believed to be the king's audience hall called, called Megron. Um, the throne is also on the side wall, quite consistent to um, the uh, Minoan culture and um, not directly facing the entrance on the on the side and this is significant because it is you know one step closer to classical temple when the greeks arrived to um to these these sites um the greeks would put columns all around the megaron and um, um you know create their their temple uh, first in column uh, first in wood, like the uh, Mycenaeans, and uh, later they will replace them with stone, and that created those uh, monumental architecture. Like so, um, the, during Mycenaean time, uh, around you know, 1300 BCE, uh, those were uh, constructed in wood, and today only the footprint survives. The foot, so the columns. Um, and uh, the remains or the lower walls of the ceiling are all gone. So um, that kind of um, can provide a good transition to um, classical Greek architecture. So the Greek architecture inherited a lot from the previous cultures, especially the Mycenaean culture, but the, they had a different social organization, they had a different politics, they had a different spiritual world. So they adopt something from previous cultures, but they, they also uh, created something entirely new. One of them is the democratic um, political system. So it was in ancient Greece that uh, institutionalized um, democracy was practiced. As a result, um, there was no king in, in most Greek cities. And like the ancient Mesopotamians, those are city-states, all right? They, they were cities, but they were independent. They did not belong to a kingdom or an empire. Those, each city was an independent state. So we call them city-state. It is called polis or police um, in, 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 in Greek. Um, so with the replacement of royal hierarchical power with a political egalitarian power, no citizen can be placed in a superior position over any other citizen. So the Acropolis, the castle, should not provide home for a king, rather, they provide home for the patron god and the goddesses for each city. Also like Mesopotamian city-states, each Greek city had their own patron, patron god or goddess, like Athena to, to Athens. So the deities are placed in what used to be the kings, Megaron above, while the polit political power is vested in the agora below. What is agora? agora is um, a square, basically. But that square was surrounded by architecture serving um, democracy. So there were um, halls for council, for judge, for, um, you know, for debate um, and uh, for voting. So that is the agora. Um, so even though they inherited a lot from the previous cultures, 
the way they were being used are quite different. So we will first look at the sacred architecture, focusing on um, the Acropolis in Athens, and then we will look at the Athenian, look at the Athenian Agora, uh, which has those kind of civil, um, civic uh, architecture. The Greeks, um, there were many independent states, but they share a common identity because of the shared mythology, right? Mythology, classical mythology was like the religion for the Greeks and, uh, and the Romans, uh, the, the later Romans as well. The city belonged to its citizen, not the god. So this is kind of different from Mesopotamian. So the patron goddess, uh, this uh, for the Greeks were, even though there was a patron god or goddess for a Greek city, its relationship was, was quite different. For example, in Greek mythology, we constantly uh, read that, you know, the, the gods need to compete to win the favor of the people. Uh, so it's kind of work very well with the democratic system of their governance. So it, to some extent, the patron deity for a city were kind of elected uh, by um, the citizens. Um, <clears throat> and, but that place, that temple also represent the collective identity of the city state, the, the police, uh, which is the Greek word for city state. Um, a common identity among various um, city-states were created because of the shared mythology, and, and that mythology was um, uh, kind of uh, popularized and celebrated in festivals. So there were many, many Pan-Hellenic festivals. Pan-Hellenic means this is participated not by just one city-state, but all those Greek speaking um, city states. And uh, one of the most famous was the Olympic. Olympic was one of the um, Pan Hellenic festivals. And during those festivals, um, there were games, um, people compete um, the, uh, in um, athletic games. Um, and they also uh, made sacrifice to their gods and the goddesses. Uh, they also had performance, theatrical performance, first to, um, to have a narrative for the mythology, but later also became more and more kind of entertainment. And there was um, a lot of drinking and uh, feast um, as well. Sacrificial animals were also um, feasted upon. So Olympic game was originally um, like that, but today, of course, it is the most uh, important uh, athletic. and concealing the cella, right? So this core um, now in Greek temple is known as cella or nails. Um, you know, cella was from the Latin word, nails from the Greek word. Um, so they, they could be referred to either way. So let's call them nails. Nails is like the throne room, but now there's no king. So it's not a throne. There's no throne anymore. Usually there was a a sculpture um, of the god um, inside. And then there's a pro nails, which is basically the porch. Um, and uh, there was also a, a, back, a back room, uh, but they could be quite symmetrical, but they could also be not symmetrical. Sometimes the back room was more closed up, uh, also with doors um, and, and the gates instead of an open porch. But the basic um, construction of a Greek temple is 
adding column surrounding that. And from Mycenaean culture, we understand the column is almost a divine uh, in pre-Greek culture. Uh, it is also um, the case for the Greek culture. So columns are used for significant symbolic um, sacred architecture. Uh, they are kind of a, um, representing uh, the divinity. The, um, the Athenian Acropolis, Athenian Acropolis was part of the, um, a ceremonial uh, festival. Um, this festival known as the uh, Panathenic, Panathenic, Panathenic um, festival. At first, it was just um, celebrated locally, just in the city-state of Athens. But after the Persian War, um, you know, the Athens uh, became the leader of the Greek world because they formed the legion to defeat the invading Persian army led by Xerxes. Um, so they became the was challenged by Sparta, which was the kingdom. <coughs> so there was the Persian War. Persian War. So when Athens was the leader of the Greek world, um, this the local festival was also celebrated. So the pan was added. So it became pan-ethnic. Um, so during that festival, a sacred garment called peplos made by Athenian maidens was carried through the city to dress the couch statue of Athena Parthenos. Athena Parthenos was inside the temple of Parthenon. So Parthenon was basically the home to Athena Parthenos. Uh, that is Athena as the, um, as the goddess of the maidens, you know, as as a um, young lady. Um, so that procession passed through the northern gate of the city, entering the city, and also passed through the agora. So this map shows the relationship between the civic agora and the sacred Acropolis. Pass through it diagonally and um, goes around the hill and enter the gate. And um, the procession would um, go around and then enter, also enter Parthenon to dress up the city. All Greek, um, the Panathenic um, festival also include competitions, games, sacrifice and, and banquet. Um, so that is common among Greek festivals. And that's their religious service, basically, making sacrifice to their um, god and goddess, goddesses and then feast upon them. So <clears throat> the original Acropolis was destroyed. Um, the original Acropolis from the sixth century was destroyed by the Persians in 480 BCE. At the aftermath of the Persian War, Pericles, um, you know, the great leader of the, um, the, you know, the, the Greek uh, states, um, rebuilt the Acropolis, incorporating the Ionic and Doric orders to represent the political ascendancy of Athens. So <clears throat> in most, in all major buildings after the Periclean reconstruction, um, Ionic and Doric orders were combined in one building to make a declaration of political kind of unity and also to claim that Athens was the, you know, not only about Athens, it about the entire Greek world. Because Ionic is not local to Athens. 
Ionic belong to the Eastern Island area, the uh, Asia Minor, and the Doric was more local. Um, it originated on the um, Peloponnesus uh, Peninsula, but the Periclean Acropolis used both order um, and um, to uh, indicate that here, this is the monument, not only for Athens, it is for the entire uh, Greek world. So what are these two orders? <clears throat> the two orders, the Ionic order, the Doric order. So here, I'm not going to um, use class time to talk about the, um, the, the, the term, all right? So these are your own, um, you can do it on your own. And please look at the um, appropriate pages and you can find the page number on the review slides as well. And you should know those terms, all right? So in my lecture, I'm just going to use those words, use those terms. And after reading, you should have already been familiarized with those terms. And if you don't, you need to go back to check it out. So you should understand the, what are those words meaning. Um, and it, and for those that I, I, I use, for those terms that I use a lot in the lecture, they are probably more important than, than others listed on the same illustration. <clears throat> so here, I think I just wanted to point out each order has a different capital style and each order had a different um, frieze, different architecture, the architrave and frieze, the way they were shaped, they were divided, are quite different, and also different proportion. Um, the ionic order originally were from this area, this kind of blue area, right? These are the um, uh, area of Ionian dialects, and their capital was called the ionic capital. Um, and the Doric, Doric um, were from this area, the peninsula. Um, so Athens is located somewhere here. So it kind of a, at the center of these different re, uh, dialectic uh, regions and it used the two most popular orders, um, capital styles to create a union of architecture and to celebrate the victory um, after the um, after the defeat of the Persian army, and that was um, the Athenians certainly consider that victory was won by the unity created by the leadership of Athens. So um, these details, <coughs> um, not only in terms of their the, the, the detail of carving, how those different parts were shaped, but also in terms of uh, proportion. The Doric order was more, more squat, um, so it, the columns were thicker and more, all, all the capitals were more simplistic, and it was meant to represent the body, um, you know, the, the, the male body. And, um, so um, the frieze was divided into the triglyph and the metal P. The metal P usually has relief sculptures. Um, and um, then it has a continuous architrave, right? The, the architrave was not divided. Cornice, frieze, and architrave are collectively, collectively referred to as entablature. It's basically the, um, the roof, the upper structure of the roof. Um, and then below it is the column. And below the columns is the, the steps. The steps are called the stylobate, um, the stylobate supporting the column shaft directly. And then two steps of stereobate. The Greek um, Doric was also without a base. So there is no base for the Doric order. And um, 
the Doric order, you know, one thing I wanted to point out um, that is, um, I mentioned that the Greeks also used to build their temple in wood, but later they replaced them with marble and uh, to um, take advantage of the stone to create an eternal structure that lasts long. Um, but a lot of details survived from the previous wooden construction. Um, this is an illustration of a wooden Greek temple should be look, look like. Um, there are a lot of architectural detail that didn't make much sense in stone architecture, but they were originally part of the uh, necessary uh, structural element in wooden architecture. One is the so-called triglyph, right? This tri triglyph used to be the uh, decorative part to hide the end of a beam, right? In wooden construction, there is a beam and it is um, raised above um, the lower, lower beam. Um, and that end um, needs to be hidden. Um, and that is usually uh, kind of a, covered by a, 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 a ceramic, um, a ceramic decorative plate. plate. Um, so it is totally unnecessary in stone architecture because in stone architecture, this is a continuous kind of piece of, of wooden uh, beam. Um, it is no longer um, like the wooden structure having that um, crossing beams. Um, so there's no need to have that, but it survived as a decoration from the earlier wooden construction. Another um, detail is the, uh, the so-called gatier. You know, these, this little plaque with a circular knob on it, it's called gatier. The gatier um, used to be a necessary uh, member um, to nail the lower plate um, at the eave, but this is entirely unnecessary in stone architecture because this is just a one complete piece of stone. Like this is one complete piece of stone. So there's no kind of decorative lower part to seal um, the imperfect kind of wooden finish. Um, but nonetheless, this kind of a um, stone carving mimicking the nail end was carved there. So. Uh, this is a expanded uh, image of that part. So that's the um, <clears throat> um, the Doric order. Um, the Ionic order is considered feminine. It has a proportion of one to nine. Um, the diameter of the base drum to the height of the column um, is one to nine. So it's more slender than the Doric order. It also has a base, right? The base um, rests on the stylobate um, and then the base support the, uh, the drums of the, of the column. It also has a continuous um, frieze and the, the, the architrave was also divided into um, three layers. Um, the Ionic and the Doric order were more than just the style of the, on the facade. Uh, it is also in plan. For example, Doric order usually has one peristyle, meaning just one um, encircling colonnade. But the Ionic order has two. So we have the double um, peristyle, we call that double peristyle. Um, the ionic capital also needs to be specially made for the corner because it, it is directional. The uh, circular abacus of the um, Doric order does not need to separ uh, separate the um, corner capital or the, um, 
the inner capital, but the ionic order does, right? Because it has a front and a side. The front is the this kind of swirling, spiraling, curved um, decoration. And um, um, that is a front. And then the side is not meant to be shown to the front of the building. It was meant to be on the side. So, so the corner capital needs to be specially made, right? So at this corner capital, the, um, uh, the scroll um, intersect in, instead of parallel to, to each other um, because you want the, um, uh, the, the both side of the facade to have a scroll instead of the side of the scroll. So um, it has a corner problem like that. Um, <clears throat> Green temples were constructed in dry masonry. against earthquake. So these stone members were fixed to one another. Um, <clears throat> vertically, they were quite stable, but they cannot resist horizontal force, horizontal thrust. So as a result, the, um, you need something to glue them together. Now it's not liquid glue. Uh, now they use the um, metal uh, clamp to to make the connection. And those were also used during the construction, um, construction process to, to be raised and, and lowered from above. And after that, the metal part could remain inside and make connection with neighboring, uh, neighboring stone blocks. Greek temple is like um, a huge sculpture. Why did I say that? Because unlike the Egyptian pyramid, uh, the stone to build Greek temple were not poured in standardized uh, size to be simply put one on top of the other. They were custom made and they were um, quarried for a specific location. So each of the stone blocks were numbered and they were specifically for a location in the building. So they were pre-planned. It's not like you get a bunch of construction material and then, then you use whichever brick uh, on whichever location you like. Um, it's the, those stone blocks were all individually horrid. And during the sh shipping, uh, during the um, transportation process, they use wooden wheel to make the transportation and the moving easier. So for the construction of the um, Athenian Acropolis, um, marbles were quarried from the Pentelic quarry. So they were referred to as, as Pentelic uh, marble, which was famous for their purity and for their you know, shining white surface and considered the best to make carving, to make sculpture. So they basically use kind of sculptural material for the construction of their um, temple, the most, um, the most important temple, of course. Greek temple was more sculptural than architectural, also in that carvings and the finishings were, and, and the finishes were done after the blocks were assembled. Um, on the site. So you quarrel those stone from the quarry, shift to the site, pile them up, and all those detailed the carving were completed after the building was already standing there. We know that because there was a unfinished temple from Segesta, and um, the temple was unfinished because its citizens were massacred by Syracuse. It shows that the building blocks still had that focus for transportation. Right? During the transportation, you need those protruding um, unfinished surfaces to make a stable connection with the wheel. And they were piled together. They need to be polished away. And the surface needs to be polished. And the column needs to be fluted 
the base needs to be carved, uh, et cetera, and et cetera. But it was not finished. Uh, so we know the temple were completed on the site, like the making of the sculpture. So the Athenian Acropolis. Let's see. Right. I'm going to give you a break. Uh,